and of course, you know, shipwrecks are where we're here primarily. Um, and this stems back really towards, you know, the middle 19th century when, as the Great Lakes region was, was growing um, in industry, in frontier, in scale, in populated areas, um, the maritime highway was the way to move goods and people. And what's interesting is a lot of these shipping lanes, these are designated highways, right? Designated lanes that, that, that vessels are, are plying the lakes on largely haven't changed um, up until modern days. So as you're rounding kind of, you know, the, the Northeast Michigan area off Alpena, a lot of these vessels are hugging the shore, right? And, you know, in a in an era without radar, without GPS, without adequate weather forecasting, without ship to ship or ship to shore radio. It's no surprise that, that things happen out here, right? Human error, fire, storms, ice, all kinds of things wreak havoc on the lakes. Um, and, and, and that's pervaded through 1966, which was, you know, the the last known shipwreck here in the sanctuary, uh, the German freighter Nordmere, which ran aground just off Middle Island. So there's still really threatening areas, even with those technological advancements that I mentioned. Um, but the shipping lanes primarily haven't changed. And so it's prime real estate for, uh, for bad things to happen, sadly. And that's a large, large reason why we're here. And, you know, Thunder Bay itself is a, really represents an eclectic, almost complete collection of all the vernacular craft from the Great Lakes, right? And that's kind of where I want to shift gears and, and speak to a few of these examples, um, highlighting what they were doing, where they were going, and how Alpena played a role, Northeast Michigan played a role in their careers. Um, and, and first up is, is the oldest shipwreck in Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary, the Side Wheeler, New Orleans. It was built in 1838. This was really built at the time of, of westward expansion of, you know, uh, steamers carrying largely immigrants from uh, Wales, Ireland, um, uh, Scotland, uh, all kinds of northern Scandinavian countries um, were coming over largely on these side wheel steamers. And they were pushing west as, you know, rail networks just didn't exist in the midden until a little bit later. Um, this was the only way to get around. So you think about communities like Milwaukee and Sheboygan and Manitowoc, Wisconsin. This is how they're getting there. And they're passing by Thunder Bay every single trip. New Orleans burned uh, just off Thunder Bay Island um, and is in about 12 feet of water. Really incredible, incredible story. Everybody got off okay. Um, and we're, we're aided by some, uh, you know, some help from the Thunder Bay Island community that was there. Um, incredible site. This is one that you'll actually uh, likely get a chance to visit if you take a trip on the glass bottom boat here in, uh, in Michigan. And this is um, another look at the New Orleans, part of the New Orleans ship, uh, shipwreck site. This is generated from a uh, three-dimensional model of the site. A three-dimensional model is created by basically swimming over this site underwater and taking hundreds and oftentimes thousands of individual photographs that have enough overlap where you can stitch automatically through a modeling software, stitch common points. And so what you get is a whole bunch of overlapping images that stitch together to make these photo models that allows for Largely quick, uh, quick and dirty documentation of these sites, um, but you can see. I mean, some of the uh, some of the preservation here. There's a sponson cover that's kind of in the back now on that piece of flat uh, ceiling planking. Um, there's lots to analyze here, and for a site that's been down that long, um, it really is so so nice and so lucky of us to be able to have a site like this in that condition. Um, but you know the side wheel side wheel steamers really were uh, largely people movers, um, just based on how um, the paddle wheels themselves, steam engines themselves, were oriented on the deck plans. Um, they didn't really permit a lot of uh, a lot of ease in in cargo loading and cargo stowage. 
so most of those, you know, dry bulk cargoes were, of course, carried in the age of sail by several different kinds. Um, a unique uh, vessel to the Great Lakes, a unique uh, rig, I should say, to the Great Lakes, um, was the, uh, you know, were square riggers, right? These were um, vessels and, and, and sail designs that usually plied the Atlantic waters, um, largely because it took a considerable amount of crew to furl unfurl those square sails. Most of them had to be, you know, masts had to be climbed. Um, whereas the schooner rig, which this bark, and in, in this case, you can see the triangular shape of the main mast and, uh, you know, and, and the mizzen, right? The, the, the furthest aft towards the back of the boat on the right, they've got kind of a, a different sail pattern, right? And you can see that with They've got two booms, right? That are that are sticking out. There's a top one and sort of and sort of a bottom one, right? And each of those can be managed by you know lines and halyards that are manned at the deck level. So it requires a lot less crew um, to to clamber up mass when you're you know dropping sails, putting out sails in such more frequent destinations as it was in the Great Lakes, as opposed to you know, throwing cloth up and sailing across, you know, the English Channel, uh, for example. So, but the bark here in this case um, was a transitional vessel and in some ways a transitional sail plan um, that had both elements, a square rig on the foremast and then sort of the schooner rig on the after two. American Union was built in 1862, big, 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 186 feet long, beam of 33 feet. Um, right now, you can see it in all of its glory in, uh, and in just under 15 feet of water off Thompson's Harbor State Park. It's up here um, just north of Alpena, about 20 miles. Lots of, uh, lots of great things to analyze here, um, but also want to highlight the, uh, you know, the, sh the sanctuary mooring buoy that you can see kind of in the foreground of this aerial image. This photo was shot by um, our dear friend and citizen scientist Brian Dort of Photic Zone. And the mooring buoy program really is a, is a huge part of what we do. We'll talk about that later, but these are sites that are kayakable, snorkelable, right? You don't, you don't have to be a diver to access a lot of these shallow sites. And part of that, I, I wanted to highlight for you guys here. Um, moving on to per perhaps the, the most common and the most well-known of sailing rigs um, here in the lakes was the coasting schooner. I mean, these were smaller vessels, generally, um, you know, 130 feet or less oftentimes were family owned and they were doing coastal trading, right? These were the UPS trucks that are taking things um, from Oscoda to Tawa City, right? And back and forth and back again. Um, there were thousands of these vessels plying the lakes and all of them had their own unique stories, Portland being um, uh, an intriguing story, uh, sunk off um, this incredible, incredible special place out here in Northern Michigan, Besser Bell natural area. Um, you know, ran aground with the cargo of salt. So again, you know, these these resources are incredibly accessible to us, and the sanctuary obviously plays a huge role in um, in permitting access and in promoting safe access. The mooring buoys being a great example of that. Um, so you know, what we have here, right, is in in these shallow water shipwrecks. Um, you know, they're they're affected by you know hydrodynamic forces. Um, you know, and, and, and other factors that, that change these sites that can take, you know, an intact coasting schooner um, and really, really sort of deconstruct it in a way that makes archaeology and interpretation and analysis so much fun. Um, a lot of times what happens is as, as, as ships fall apart, it's, you know, it, they largely fall off to the sides, almost like, you know, you're, you're filleting a fish. filet -o ship is sort of the, the running joke in the community um, where the sides kind of fall out. And, you know, over time, a lot of those pieces kind of wear, they make, you know, work themselves loose. Um, and so us at, as archaeologists at Thunder Bay, you know, one of the one of the big jobs we have is, is continual documentation of these sites to see how they're changing. Uh, and to learn what what's left uh, can teach us about the men and women who sailed uh, sailed these vessels days ago. Now, while the coasting schooners were, you know, largely local trade, um, there was a larger um, 
a larger class uh, called canal schooners and canal schooners were particularly interesting where um, they were built specifically for the dimensions of the new newly built Welland Canal. And the idea was, okay, well, if we can build a schooner to and stuff it within six inches of the canal, that's the most space efficient design we can make, right? And so this class of schooners was born that were very, very close in dimensions, all of them. And they feature some unique features that, you know, were, were vernacular, unique to the Great Lakes uh, shipbuilding tradition, including, um, you know, a, a retractable bowsprit where um, those, uh, you know, those three sheets, three sails that are sticking out on that jib boom, those can actually retract and, and basically they can fold that up um, to stuff this schooner even closer to the to the front of the next lock. Um, they had, you know, retractable, retractable center boards, um, or retractable dagger boards, if you will, where they could take that keel and, uh, and, and just pull it up, right? And there's a huge trunk that's along the center line of the vessel. And by, you know, taking, taking the center board up and out of the water, especially on those transits through these canal systems, they were able to increase their draft that was al uh, you know, allowed by the canals, which of course were the determining factor um, of, of the size. And um, there, was, there was quite a few of these uh, that applied the lakes. Um, E.B. Allen is, is a great example of one, a little bit on the smaller side, but um, certainly when you look through a lot of these vessel histories, Canal schooners really come into light when you see where their ports of call are. These were largely kind of long distance, you know, freight trains, if you will. I mean, they were going from Duluth to Buffalo, to Cleveland, um, to Detroit, to Alpena, to Mackinac Island, all the way down to Chicago. These guys were crossing the lakes um, over and over and over again. And E.B. Allen, uh, sadly, involved in a collision. Um, uh, you know, with, uh, with, with, with a passing ship who didn't stop. Um, there was no fatalities, thankfully. Um, but a, a great example of, you know, what some of the more intact vessels can look like, right? Where E.B. Allen, you know, looked a lot like the Portland that we showed just a few slides ago. Um, but here in 100 feet of water, um, you know, we're looking at really a, a whole different uh, animal, if you will. And, and certainly a unique challenge as an archaeologist to now deal with what you're given, which in this case is quite a lot, um, and to really study and, 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 and analyze what's missing is a fun challenge. Um, so today, you know, we, we maintain active uh, mooring systems on the E.B. Allen uh, and are constantly learning more from, uh, fr from what's there um, to also shed light on some of these other coasting and canal schooner shipwrecks that are in the sanctuary based on what we do see. As the schooner age and, and, and the, the age of sail it continued, you know, well into the early 20th century, but um, steam development occurred and developed on the Great Lakes a little bit later than it did on the Atlantic seaboard for uh, many reasons. Um, but principally, there just there wasn't there wasn't a lot of demand for for new hulls. You had you know fresh water that's keeping you know, uh, schooners afloat for far longer than they do in, in saltwater environments. Um, and there was also a, a number of accidents that, that occurred in sort of early Great Lakes steam. Um, but naturally, it was inevitable that steam's takeover uh, was coming. And really, the middle of the 19th century was when that started to be to begin. Um, the Puabic is a is, is a great example of this uh, sort of transition from sail to steam on the Great Lakes, and also dynamic, a dynamic story of uh, the various industries that one particular vessel um, could facilitate. Puabic was built uh, during the Civil War, 1863. It was built as a um, combination passenger package freight propeller. What does that mean? Well. It had multiple functions. It was a passenger ship by trade. So you can see the first class cabins up top uh, and then below decks in the gangways were steerage passenger, steerage passenger areas for 
uh, immigrants and people traveling on the cheap, but we're also sharing decks with um, livestock and cargo, et cetera. But it was also carrying package freight. What's package freight? Package freight is anything you can fit in a package, right? Pretty easy. It is your crate of potatoes. It is your barrel of copper. It can be anything that's largely unloaded by hand, something that isn't dry bulk cargo. Um, and so Puabic was plying the lakes, you know, bringing people and things back and forth from you know, Lake Superior's Keweenaw Peninsula um, down to Detroit and Cleveland, which is where its ports of call were. Now, when it went down, um, of course, a, a, a deeply troubling time in the United States. Um, and it was also a time when we had things like pay time off for the first time ever. Um, as, you know, as citizens were, were reeling from the war, and, and especially as, you know, kind of the, the beginning of, of the white collar class can be you know, traced at this time, folks were interested in, in getting out of the city, in recreating, um, in recovering spiritually and mentally and physically in many cases from the horrors of the war. Um, and we started seeing cruise lines pop up in the Great Lakes to appeal to that desire. You can read it in this, you know, in this uh, poster where, you know, where they're going is incredibly beautiful places. I love all these places. Um, but, you know, there's ample opportunity given to visit the stamping mills of the Quincy, Pawabuc, and Franklin copper mines. You know, the, the, the attraction to the great white north was was built during this time and in Pawabic health facilitating this. Um, now, of course, its main package freight cargo that it was coming back with from the Keweenaw, as you can all guess, uh, at this time was native copper. Native copper was incredibly lucrative, um, especially during the war, buttons and uh, you know, canteens and all kinds of things that had uses for, for just about every angle of the war effort. Um, but copper mines didn't have rail systems at that time that went directly, connected directly to, to the lower lake ports. Um, and they didn't have their own fleets of, uh, you know, of, of, of transportation vessels. So they would basically ship their copper in the holds of, of something like Pawabic, um, markets downstate where, you know, you can see um, they were increasingly aware of, um, of its demand as a wartime commodity. And so Pawabic would be making larger and larger trips. Um, and a few of these boats like Pawabic really became known um, as these, uh, you know, these sort of copper carriers. Um, you know, you can see the production for, for the major uh, Q and on mines, um, you know, kind of waned as the, as the war um, kind of dropped off towards the end. Um, and but Pawabic obviously was still making these runs. And on sort of one fateful evening in August 1865, you know, Pawabic was downbound, um, you know, and ran into its sister ship Meteor, you know, owned by the same line. Um, they played this sort of chicken dance um, where it was clear. I mean, there wasn't any reason for this accident to happen. Um, but Pawabic ended up cutting over across into the path of oncoming meteor. Um, you can probably imagine how the story ended. Sadly, there was a, a number of, of fatalities. Um, not to mention the uh, the holds, you know, filled with with native copper, and you know, almost instantaneously after the uh, the sadly brief grieving period um, was over, you know, attention was quickly averted to the financial potential of salvaging Puabic's hold. And immediately there were um, suitors of all kinds uh, interested in um, developing plans, technology, equipment um, to remove this copper. And, you know, Puabic sits in, in an interesting spots in about 165 feet of water. 
about 28 miles east of here in Alpena. There really wasn't a lot of diving technology um, that was available to operate in those kinds of depths. Um, but it attracted some interesting folks that decided to challenge that reality, um, including Billy Pike, 1865, uh, the first um, the first attempt, the first fatality to salvage Pawabic. Um, and what really served as kind of like a historical gut check, right? Uh, this was not going to be easy. Um, this wasn't, you know, a, um, you know, a harbor job by any means. Um, this was a time when we knew nothing about things like the bends, decompression sickness. We, we didn't understand pressures that related to its physiological effects on the body at depth. Um, and as sort of we went on, there was sort of more suitors and more creativity and more investment as sadly more people lost their lives in this pursuit. Um, Oliver Pelkey was the next, uh, kind of the next suitor in this case, after uh, a nice long break, 1865, now we're in 1891, Pelkey had developed this suit, um, largely a cloth overlay on top of a, of a, of a bronze undershell. Um, and he, uh, he didn't make it, um, quickly, you know, challenging him was sort of, a um, another inventor at the time. I didn't know this until I really got into this research, but really cool to find out that folks like E.H. Brawls and Oliver Pelkey were actually going toe to toe on all kinds of things, diving suits being the last thing they went toe to toe on. Um, but E.H. Brault was uh, was the first to successfully conduct a dive um, to the wreck of the Pawabic, but it was under strange circumstances. They didn't recover any copper. Um, he made one dive and left immediately. Um, could have been an experience he had diving the vessel, but he went through some considerable development invention um, to get to the spot where he was able to conduct that dive. And as mysteriously as he left, we, we didn't hear from him again. Um, but in a sense, this was, this was certainly affirmation that it was possible. Um, B.J. Smith um, in, uh, G.W. Smith, excuse me, in 1897, this is probably one of my favorite attempts um, and favorite designs was a diving bell. And, you know, the, Smith was looking at this thinking, you know, how, how is a diving suit, how is a one atmospheric dive suit going to be able to get the amount of copper that we really need to make this profitable? Um, so he had the idea of basically directing a clam bucket from the perspective of a diving bell. Naturally, these this strategy had large destructive effects on the shipwreck itself. Um, most of the first class cabins were destroyed at this point. Um, and it, it, but it really wasn't that big of a unit. Um, two folks could be inside this bell, you know, watching from uh, the portholes um, that you can see here. It had iron feet. Uh, and I'll go back a slide to, to point out, um, if you see these claw, these claw looking things, um, there was actually ways for them to level the bell on the, on the lake bottom with these feet. I mean, it was almost like a rudimentary Mars lander. I mean, the, the, the amount of technology that, that's pumped into this with the depths that they're working in in 1897, I mean, it's cool. Like this is a really well thought out design. Um, they had a successful salvage for one summer. They came back the next summer, all rearing to go to continue the journey. One of those portholes cracked uh, and drowned uh, the two uh, the two men inside, including one of their chief investors. So, um, arguably the first successful salvage at a commercial scale, um, but didn't uh, you know didn't end well. Um, fast forward uh, to the middle of World War One. Let's not forget Powabics wartime commodity attraction, the copper, right? 1917, um, Levitt builds this beautiful 
manganese bronze one atmospheric dive suit. So we're sitting in one atmosphere of pressure right now. And the idea is this suit is capable of withstanding pressure so that the body on the inside of it is still at one atmosphere. That suit is built so well that it's taking all the pressure at depth. It had a, an air recirculation system. Um, it was very, very advanced. It was nicknamed the Iron Duke for good reason. Um, credit goes here to Thunder Bay Sanctuary Research Collection. If you're interested in images like these and others, please check out special collections at the Alpena County Public Library. Um, and so BF Levitt went to town. Now his strategy was similar to Smith's Diving Bell where he himself isn't removing uh, material, but he's directing the show from his perspective underwater. Pretty successful. They got a lot out. And, you know, Levitt really wasn't interested in Pawabic. He was interested in gaining investor support for oceanographic expeditions. Uh, and he did just that. If you're interested to learn more about B.F. Levitt, just Google his name. He went all over the world. Um, just some of the, the haul from their 1917 expedition. Um, and this is such a great photograph. It tells so many stories. Um, uh, just in, in the foreground, of course, you can see the different kinds of copper, right? I mean, Keweenaw copper is known, famously known, as some of the most pure copper on the planet. Oftentimes it doesn't need to be smelted. You can see these sort of the barrels of loose pieces. And then in the foreground, these massive mangled odd shapes um, were just pure copper. And the stuff that was even just a little grade below that was smelted into these beautiful lingots, stamped with the mines they came from. Um, but perhaps I think the story that, that is most important here is what these gentlemen are standing on. And that's the... Um, you know, that's the, the largely the material culture of, of, the, of the cabins, um, of the hull. Um, and a lot of this wood really wasn't desired by the crew and the salvage. You can clearly see their priority is not with the stuff in the background. It's with the money in the front. And so, you know, the, the residents here in Alpena, it's just some great, great history out there, you know, that speaks of all the, the residents just coming down and, you know, grabbing pieces of wood from Pawabic's cabins and doors and all kinds of things and, and making chess boards and, you know, walking sticks. And you know, apparently the Alpena police department got a whole, got outfitted with batons, you know, made from Pawabic wood. So lots of, uh, of sort of continued material culture here. Um, and, and they, they did a number on Pawabic in 17. Really, there wasn't a whole lot left. Um, Greg Bush, 1974. Uh, Greg is still around. He's running a, a salvage, salvage operation out of Saginaw. Um, he and his family came and uh, basically finished the job. Um, this is what he saw uh, in his book um, when they were kind of doing technical diving operations um, and removing it by hand. Now, what's, what's interesting is, you know, we, we know all of this, um, we've got all this history, yet there's only one photograph of Pawabic ever taken that we've ever found. Um, and as an archeologist, right, that's the most exciting part it is, is not just telling the story of Pawabic and its incredible industries that it facilitated in the Civil War and, and you know, the, the story of Keweenaw Copper and the beginning of, you know, different labor laws that allowed people to go on cruises. Um, but it's salvage, you know, like it's, it's history um, after its sinking um, is, uh, is, is arguably just as interesting and important to Pawabic's legacy as I think of its history above water. And the fact that we only have one photograph ties that all together, right? And, and I think emphasizes the need for this kind of, this kind of academic work. Um, a couple data products that I wanna share that, that we've created here. Um, this is a site plan, you know, this is drawn by hand of, of what the site looks like right now. Um, of course, these shipwrecks are forever changing, even in some of the deep water. Um, this is another 3D model of the site. Um, 
twin screws. It had twin single uh, single cylinder direct acting steam engines with independent boilers uh, to supply them. Had this really cool centerline arch, and this was basically designed to at 200 feet long to really strengthen the fore and aft uh, segments of the ship, longitudinally strengthen the boat um, against hogging and sagging, right? As wood starts to, to move and warp, especially at this weight under this stress. But they didn't want to have those hogging arches on the side of the vessel. This is a first class cruise ship, right? So they built the centerline arch in, they incorporated it into the cabins. Um, I mean, this was first class luxury in 1865. And of course, some of this is, is still, uh, still available to be seen at 170 feet today. Shifting gears, but continuing uh, the journey as steam is now well accepted. This is almost the turn of the 20th century. And now we're getting into perhaps the Great Lakes most, um, most, uh, lucrative maybe is the wrong word, but um, certainly the most, um, the, the longest running dry, raw, you know, dry bulk cargo, which of course is iron ore. 1890s, this is a time when iron mines were starting to get really under their feet and they're starting to not just contract vessels to take iron ore down to lower lake ports, but now they're building vessels as fleets to exclusively take them, take those cargoes down to lower lake ports. Uh, Grecian was, um, you know, one of a few sisters and Norman as well, all part of the Menominee transit line. Um, you know, Grecian is sunk in hundred feet of water. It's, it's perhaps one of my favorite recreational dive sites here in Thunder Bay. Um, incredible preservation and, and really telling the story of kind of the growth of that Lake Superior iron ore. This is the beginning of really iron ore industry getting serious and, and, and designing vessels to fit the needs of, of their mines and, and also to the, to the specificities of unloading and loading equipment, dockside in places like Marquette, also in places like Cleveland. Um, so there's a lot going in that, that, that made these ships the way they are. Um, and I'm sure you can largely see, you know, some of the, um, some of the similarities to, uh, uh, to to bulk freighters today. Norman, of course, sister ship to the Grecian, and and to no coincidence, also sunk in Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary after a um, really horrendous collision with a, a Canadian wooden steamer Jack um, in the middle of the fog. It's an incredible eyewitness account from the uh, you know some of the heroes at the Thunder Bay Island Life Saving Station who through the fog, the, the only way they could triangulate where the accident happened was a sailor banging on a tin pan, you know, sitting on a piece of flotsam from the jack. I mean, this is, this is real deal stuff. Um, and Norman, of course, is in a little bit deeper water, which is an archeologist. Here you have a really exciting opportunity, two sister ships built almost, almost, almost identically. One's in 200 feet of water, uh, one's in 100 feet of water. I should note that both of these, for, for largely that reason and the importance of these vessels to the developing iron ore industry, have been listed to the National Register of Historic Places. And for good reason, right? I mean, this is Shipwreck Alley. Absolutely incredible states of preservation. Ships like Norman, people come from all over this planet to come see. Um, Cornelia B. Windiet, I, this is the last uh, site-specific example I'm going to share, and, and for good reason. Um, Cornelia B. Windiet was a, uh, was a canal schooner that was plying the lakes. It was last seen for, it was last seen in, uh, in, in, in the northern Lake Michigan, disappeared in a snow squall, was never seen from again uh, until, uh, until the uh, 1970s um, when it was discovered in the 80s actually um classic classic coasting schooner this is a beautiful image um by bob mcgreevy who who lives down uh, close to your parts um just a fantastic example showcasing um really the sail pattern of of canal schooners the raft topsail um the schooner rig i mean this is just beautiful 
And after it was discovered, um, of course, fully intact, masts are still standing. Um, we conducted a, a site plan, you know, drew this underwater, which is a relatively big ask in 185 feet of water. You really only have 20, 25 minutes on the bottom with another 45 minutes of decompression per dive. So really it's a lot of work uh, to document something like this in that water, that kind of water. So, of course, you know, utilizing, you know, advanced digital imagery um, like the 3D model to uh, give us a snapshot of, you know, how the wind is sitting off the bottom right now um, and continuing to shoot these models can really give us a good look about what's changing, what's happening to the site. Um, so, uh, of course, a great tool in, uh, in today's modern age, um, you know, slates and tape measures are, are the traditional way to do it. And certainly we're proficient and encouraged by those methods. Um, but especially when in tandem with with methods like, you know, digital 3D renderings like this, it's a no brainer. So we're jumping quickly from the lake uh, in this slide to, to our building. I'm, I'm, I hope and I'm sure uh, many of you folks uh, have been to the Great Lakes Maritime Heritage Center in Alpena. If you haven't, we're closed right now, but please come when we are open. It's a free museum. I think we're closed five or six days out of the year. Um, so no excuse, come on up and see us. And, and, and principally um, for, for, for this reason, um, shipwrights, came and helped design and build a, uh, an actual replica of the Cornelia B. Windiet, similar vessel uh, right here in the Great Lakes Maritime Heritage Center where you can walk the decks uh, and sail a Great Lakes Canal schooner. Um, absolutely beautiful exhibit. Uh, it's been here uh, since 2008. Now, the sanctuary, of course, principally is focused on shipwrecks and cultural resources, but there's plenty of other science that we help facilitate. Um, and it's hard to, uh, to imagine discussing what I do, what a lot of us at Thunder Bay do, without perhaps one of our favorite projects that happens annually, and that has nothing to do with shipwrecks. It's more focused on the benthic communities of sinkholes, right? We've all heard or seen uh, these incredible, you know, karst geological formations that have happened in places like Rockport State Park, but they also happen in the lake. Um, in the case of Middle Island sinkhole, um, there's a depression that's 85 feet deep where it's it's, it's fed by an outcropping, basically a spring of groundwater where aquifers from you know, around the region have basically bubbled up, eroded the limestone geology to a point where highly sulfuric, highly anoxic uh, water, that's zero oxygen. So imagine you're at the bottom of the lake and a fish is swimming by you and then starts to, to, to wilt um, and, uh, and passes on because it can't survive in water. Um, that's coming from this, you know, aquifer, you know, under the lake uh, source. And what's interesting is the organisms that do grow here are, are largely um, have been um, have, have been sort of analogs to, you know, pre-oxygenated earth. Um, so we've been doing some incredible research with, um, you know, with some scientists from the Max Planck Institute of Microbiology in Bremen, Germany, Grand Valley State University, University of Michigan, Michigan State, and others um, to really analyze this, this, this mat, that's bacterial mat. Some of it's photosynthetic, relies on light to reproduce some of its chemosynthetic. Those are the white stringers, which are sort of chemically active um, and, and feed off the sulfur and other minerals in this groundwater. Um, this is a cool photo though, where you can see this burbot is basically hiding in this eddy where in the background, you can sort of see there's lighter and then there's a darker layer of water. And while it looks like sunlight or a light source, it's actually the density layer difference, um, the separation of lake water above and heavier groundwater below. And what's happening is lake water is, is you know, flying, uh, flying over this rocky ledge as it's descending down to 85 feet and it's mixing and it's creating this little eddy current that the burba can just sort of hang out in. Um, so incredible research at the sanctuary, at the, at the sinkhole, with sanctuary partners. Um, and when we've been, you know, uh, supporting that science really since the beginning. So great work. There's uh, tons of resources out there. I encourage you to uh, just put in your web browser, Middle Island Sinkhole, and you'll find all kinds of stuff to keep you entertained for hours. 
beautiful science um, and something that we're really excited to support every single year. Another big part of our uh, of, of, of our days is the morning blue program. Um, this is what I'll be doing all day tomorrow and likely the next day um, is maintaining our seasonal uh, our seasonal mooring buoys. It's 42 buoys that we maintain to promote responsible access for divers, snorkelers, fishermen, sailors, paddlers, glass bottom boat viewers. Um, and uh, they're in a variety of depth ranges, right? You sort of got a hint of this at the beginning, American Union, Portland, right? These are accessible from public sites like, like state parks shallow water. And we also have sites in, in deeper water. You know, we've got a, a buoy on Pawabic that's marked at 165 feet below the surface. So incredible collection here. Um, you can see kind of the, the two the two ends of the season. Uh, I always laugh about these photos because these are generally happening in, in cold times of the year. Um, we're putting out our buoys in May. I think the, the look on, on the diver's face sort of says it all. Um, you know, 39, 40, 42 degree water. Uh, and then, you know, of course, sometimes we wait a little too long to pull them out in the snow. Um, but, uh, but generally we try to pick our days. Um, you know, you can follow our progress. Uh, we actually have an interactive morning buoy map on our website. So you can see exactly what buoys are in, what are out as a recreational diver, as a fisherman, as a charter boat operator. This is really helpful to know exactly what's in the lake in real time. Um, so with that, uh, I know uh, I wanted to save a few minutes for questions. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen and uh, and I welcome uh, welcome Emily to jump back in here. Yeah, awesome. If you guys have any questions, you can use the chat feature of Zoom, throw them in there, and we can ask them. If you're on a device where you can't get to chat, you can just unmute and ask your question, if y'all have any. Yes. Please post the, the website again you were just talking about. Oh, well, I'll put it in the chat. Have you written any books yet <laughs> regarding shipwrecks? Uh, you're not the first person to ask me that. Um, I need to. I need to, I need to write the book on Pawabak. I know RC would probably agree with you there. Um, no. Uh, and you know what? It, it, as an archaeologist, right? A lot of a lot of what I do and what we do is um, you know is largely in academic articles, um, you know, technical reports. Um, but there are a number of really powerful, incredible academic resources um, on local shipwrecks and area shipwrecks on maritime heritage in the region. Um, so, you know, definitely get with um, get with Emily and, and the librarians. And there's a huge, huge topic of um, of Great Lakes maritime history that I think will will pique your interest. Well, I enjoyed your presentation. I would really like to hear more from you about. Uh you know, Lake Michigan or Lake Superior, and you know, in particular, uh, you know, all the things that happened around Whitefish Point and stuff. Yeah, no, well said. Um, I think um, I think you'd do yourself a favor if you uh, checked out some of um, Fred Stonehouse's books. He's written a number of, uh, of really well-researched, well-written uh, academic looks at sort of regional areas, including Whitefish Bay. So um, Fred Stonehouse, definitely, uh, you know, throw out, throw out that in the, uh, in the library search. Um, it'd be uh, definitely worth your time. And thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you for a well done presentation too. Why are there so many shipwrecks in that area? Uh, where in Whitefish Point or Thunder Bay? Thunder Bay. Thunder Bay specifically, um, crossroads of the Great Lakes, right? I mean, everybody has to pass by Thunder Bay going to Superior, Lake Michigan, Lower Lake Ports. Um, and no one wanted to go up and way around the Presqu'ile Peninsula. You know, we're talking right here, right? Um, so shipping lanes were actually really quite narrow and close to shore. Um, so you had narrow shipping lanes, you had no technology, no, no radios, no GPS, no radar. 
firestorm, winds, ice, winter, um, all of those things, you know, really compound. Um, and you had all kinds of collisions, among other things. So lots of uh, lots of bad reasons why things happened. About how many shipwrecks are there in the uh, sanctuary? Sanctuary right now, uh, there's 104 known sites with another 100 yet to be found. So a question from Linda in the chat. Um, where did the immigrants come from and where were they going? Great question. Um, really for, from a lot of places. Um, you know, a lot of the Scandinavian countries uh, were well represented. Um, the Irish, uh, Scots, the Welsh were here. Um, and they were going towards areas of opportunities, uh, a lot of regions that reflected areas similar to their home and climate and geography um, and in culture, actually. I mean, you think of the like the Polish uh, connection up here. Um, they all came and, and settled these areas like, you know, just just inshore of us here in Alpina just west of here, um, and they're coming on side wheel steamers and other vessels um, really in large numbers to uh, to help settle these this new frontier. Because don't forget, middle of 19th century, this is kind of where we're at. As far as the westward expansion, uh, mass expansion, right, and the development of cities and places like Chicago um, and Milwaukee, um, this was all happening uh, really in the sort of the early to middle uh, 19th century. And this is how, you know, immigrants were, uh, were getting to those places. Another question from Kristen. Are there any modern-ish freighters that have sank in the sanctuary? Yes, Kristen, there is, there is one actually, um, the Nordmere. It's uh, a well-known vessel. Actually, it was sunk in 1966 um, and it was above water. You could actually see it. Fishermen would go and, and fish next to it uh, up until about 2008. It finally succumbed to the power of, of winter and ice flows that, that sort of dragged it underwater. Um, but Nordmere is an incredible example of really the threats of the limestone reefs that sort of line this area that provide another hazard uh, to modern navigation. I'll, uh, I'll send you a link to, the, uh, to a page where you can learn more about Nordmere. I'll put it in the chat. I know I, I answered Lori's question in the chat, but yes, the recording will be put on the library's YouTube page. Um, I, of course, started it a little late, so the first like minute is cut off, but that, that's all right. It'll get put up on White Lake Township Library's YouTube page probably tomorrow. If there are any other questions, oh, Linda, is there a reason that so many ships were built in the 1860s? It's a great question, Linda. Um, and, and, you know, and the, the answer is sort of a loaded question, right? Um, but largely the 1860s were a lot of the raw bulk industries, iron ore, copper, um, lumber, to a lesser extent fishing were really hitting their stride during the 1860s, the war effort promoted development of those industries, um, but also as rail networks were kind of penetrating um, the Midwest a little deeper, by the 1860s, we're starting to see rail, network, rail networks, especially in Southern Michigan, connecting Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. Um, so yeah, there was a lot more movement um, and a lot of the uh, kind of the, the initial beginnings of, of towns like Milwaukee and Chicago, those were sort of in the past, right? The, uh, the industrial machine was well on its way, um, you know, certainly promoted by, um, by the movement of people and the war effort, you know, really focusing, uh, you know, initiatives on things like raw bulk material to help support. And ships were the way to carry them. Uh, question from Bob, where in the Great Lakes is the greatest number of shipwrecks? It's a great question. And, and we don't know, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to compare in many ways, but there are certainly areas that are very, very shipwrecky. Uh, Thunder Bay being one of the most well-known, Whitefish Point being another 
another. Um, so, but overall, I mean, there's, you know, an estimated six to 8,000 shipwrecks in the Great Lakes, right? Most of which have not been found. Um, so there are certain collections and hotbeds for them, but, um, you know, for the majority of them haven't been found. So we don't really know. Uh, he followed that up with um, in the Straits of Mackinac as a question. Yep, yep, yep absolutely. You're uh, you're on the right track there. The Straits are certainly um, littered with sites, you know, for a lot of the same reasons that Thunder Bay is really congested area, um, close quarters, right? Things happen. Uh, then Lori said, are there any maps or lists of which wrecks can be relatively easily seen by kayak? Great question. I'm glad you asked. Um, there is. There is a uh, paddle and snorkel guide um, that we have downloadable on our website. So you can see all the mooring buoys and all the sites and how to get there and what, you know, what access points uh, to jump off of. So um, this has been a, a big focus for us, you know, in the last 10 years or so about really providing more access um, to the shallow water environment. So I think you'll be pleasantly surprised about the amount of opportunity there. All right, and then Linda asks, is the community of Fayette known for iron ore community? I know it was primarily settled by Irish. I'm not sure about Fayette uh, specifically, um, but there were plenty of Irish that were up there. Um, so it's a, it's a great question and uh, I'm not sure. So we have just a couple more minutes. If you have any last minute burning questions, uh, Bob Trotter has been making a list of sunken ships. Do you know about him? Dave Trotter, I do know about him. Yeah, he's been he's been plying the lakes looking for looking for vessels uh, for a long time. He's one of the one of the the longest running uh, you know shipwreck hunters in the Great Lakes. So yeah, he's made a number of contributions. Alrighty, awesome. A friend of Bob's, Danny Fader, dove with him. Nice. All right, yeah, if there's last, any like last minute burning questions in the next two minutes, you can shoot them. We can see if we can um, fit them in or yeah, you can reach out to Phil and Thunder Bay and get some more information from them. But I just personally wanted to say thank you guys so much for joining us tonight. Uh, I know I had a lot of fun and learned a lot, so I hope you guys did too. I'm glad you were able to join us, even though it was virtual and we can't be in person. Uh, it was still a good time. And thank you from White Lake Township Library. And thank you so much, Phil, for <laughs> joining us and uh, presenting. It was a good time. Uh, it, was, it, it was a pleasure, Emily. Um, you guys are in a great ship and it's wonderful to, to connect with you. Um, Phil.hartmeyer at no.gov again is my email. So if you want to um, get up with me about anything, I'd love to chat. So thanks so much for the opportunity. Awesome. Yeah. And if, if you need anything else, you can email us at programs at whitelakelibrary.org. We can help get you in touch with Phil and Thunder Bay and anything else you guys need from us. So with that, I will stop recording.